Let's pray as we look at that passage together. May the words of my mouth and the meditation of all our hearts be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Well, I don't know if you've noticed, but people generally fear being empty, don't they? Empty of anything, really. Do you remember back uh, before Christmas, a few months ago, there was the fuel shortages crisis? Do you remember? Now, I'm not going to pass any moral comment on it at all, um, but you'll remember that as soon as someone's car got to below, you know, 50%, we had to go to the petrol station and fill it right up full, because we feared being empty. We want full cars, we want full bank accounts, we want full bellies. At Christmas we wanted fridges full of food. We want our lives full with activity, don't we? We don't want to be running on empty. And what's true for us as individuals is true for us as a church. After all, who wants an empty church? Or who wants a church running on empty? And so here in this passage, we see the Apostle Paul's deep, deep longing for the church in Ephesus, for every church, for our church. This is what God himself wants for us. Do you see Paul's prayer where it ends at the end of verse 19? He prays that you may be filled to the measure of the fullness of God. It's what this is all about this morning, what Paul's prayer is about, that we would be filled to the measure of the fullness of God. In short, Paul prays for a full church. Now, Paul isn't praying for a full building. He's not praying that a church building would be full. Now, that's a good thing to pray for. It's good to pray for numerical growth of the church, and Paul prays for that elsewhere. But that's not what he's praying for here, because Paul knows that, tragically, it is possible to have a church that is full, but also empty, spiritually speaking. Just as it's also true to have a church that is relatively empty, but spiritually full. And so Paul longs for a church that is filled to the measure of the fullness of God. What does that mean? It's a lovely phrase, isn't it? It's a lovely phrase to dwell on and meditate on and think over, filled to the measure of the fullness of God. What does it actually mean? First thing to notice is that Paul is praying that the church would be filled to the measure of the fullness of God. Paul is talking about the church together, corporately. He's not talking about individuals. If you're anything like me, when we often think about the church being filled with the presence of God, that that a believer receives the Spirit of God living within them, if you're anything like me, you think in individual terms. When I became a Christian, God's Spirit came and lived within me. God's Spirit dwells within me, and he dwells within you if you're a believer as well. That's what I often think of. But actually, in the New Testament, and it's sometimes difficult to see this, because in English we don't distinguish between you and you. You, as an individual, or you, y'all, as Americans. If we spoke American, it'd be a lot easier, because we could say y'all were filled with the Spirit. But I won't do that, because it's a bit embarrassing. Um... But in Greek, there's singular and plural yous. And whenever the New Testament talks about you being filled with the Spirit, it uses the plural. You, the Spirit of God, dwells amongst you as the church. Of course, he dwells within me as an individual as well, but this is what Paul's talking about here. Okay? And that makes sense, doesn't it? Think about what the overriding message of Ephesians has been for the last three chapters. What has Paul been banging home in chapter 2 and chapter 3? He's been saying the gospel of Jesus Christ has come and he has reconciled 
Jew and Gentile together, and God has made a new thing. It's called the church, and it's amazing. Because every people group, every nationality, every ethnicity of the world is made one in the church as they come to faith in Jesus Christ. So it makes sense here that Paul, when he talks about God being, that the church being filled to the measure of the fullness of God, he's talking about the church. He's not praying Isaac Payne as an individual would be filled to the measure of the fullness of God. He's praying that the church as a community would be filled to the measure of the fullness of God. This is how he put it. Remember in chapter 2? Verses 19 to 22. Let me read that again. This was a couple of weeks ago, but uh, Paul says, Consequently, you're no longer foreigners and strangers, but fellow citizens with God's people and also members of his household, built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets, with Christ Jesus himself as the chief cornerstone. In him, the whole building is joined together and rises to become a holy temple in the Lord. And in him, you too are being built together to become a dwelling in which God lives by spirit. In fact, those verses where Paul talks about the church being like a temple are really helpful for grasping what Paul means when he prays that we would be filled to the measure of the fullness of God. Because the temple in the Old Testament was where God dwelt. That's where the measure of the fullness of God was experienced on earth in the Old Testament. And so Paul is praying that here and now, just like in the Old Testament, God would come amongst his people, the church, and dwell. Do you remember the Old Testament temple? In fact, do you remember before the Old Testament temple, there was the tabernacle, the tent. And even before that, there was a place where God dwelt. It was called the Garden of Eden. There was Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden and God walked amongst them and he was present with them. His dwelling was with them. And then after that, he built the tabernacle and he dwelt amongst them. And in our reading from 2 Samuel 7, David wanted to build a temple, but God said, no, your son Solomon will build it. And the temple was built and God dwelt amongst his people in the temple. If we're to grasp what it is Paul is praying for us here and what we should be praying, that we are filled to the measure of the fullness of God, we need to have in mind this Old Testament picture of the glory of God filling the temple. Because that is what God wants to do to us as the church. So let me give you a reminder of that. The prophet Ezekiel had a picture of the temple being filled with the presence of God. In Ezekiel chapter 43, and this is what he writes. He writes, Then he led me to the gate, to the gate facing east, and behold, the glory of the God of Israel was coming from the east. And the sound of his coming was the the sound of many waters, and the earth shone with his glory. And the vision I saw was like the vision that I'd seen when he came to destroy the city. And just like the vision that I'd seen by the Chiba Canal. And I fell on my face as the glory of the Lord entered the temple by the east, facing the gate facing east. The Spirit lifted me up and brought me into the inner court. And behold, the glory of the Lord filled the temple. While the man was standing beside me, I heard one speaking to me out of the temple. And he said to me, Son of man, this is the place of my throne and the place of the soles of my feet where I will dwell in the midst of the people of Israel forever. So what would it look like for God in his fullness to dwell in the church, in his temple, in his new temple, the church? Well, we're at a transitional moment in this letter. Generally speaking, Chapters 1 to 3 in Paul's letter to the Ephesians are very theological. We've been hearing about the idea of the gospel and Jew and Gentile coming together and God's salvation plan. 
and that we're saved by grace and through faith and all those things. But we're at a hinge, we're in the, gospel, in the letter, the hinge is happening, and Paul is about to transition from theology to practice. He's going to take that theology and he's going to put it into practice. And he's going to say, if all of that is true, this is then how you have to live. And we're going to see that. So, if we glance over the next few chapters, chapters 4, 5, and 6, we'll see some of the things a church will look like if it's filled to the measure of the fullness of God. So I've just picked out a few, some highlights of what's to come in the coming weeks ahead of us as we journey through chapters 4, 5, and 6 together. This is what it would look like for a church to be filled to the measure of the fullness of God. Chapter 4, verse 2, Paul writes, Be completely humble and gentle. Be patient, bearing with one another in love. Chapter 4, verses 31 and 32, Get rid of all bitterness, rage and anger, brawling and slander, along with every form of malice. Be kind and compassionate to one another, forgiving each other, just as in Christ God forgave you. Chapter 5, verses 18 to 20. Don't get drunk on wine, which leads to debauchery. Instead, be filled with the Spirit, speaking to one another with psalms, hymns, and songs from the Spirit. Sing and make music from your heart to the Lord always giving thanks to God the Father for everything in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. What an attractive vision of a church where the presence of God dwells, that everyone together as a community is transformed in the way they relate to one another, to people outside the church, If you were outside the church community and you looked in from the outside and you saw people living that way, such incredible patience with each other, bearing one another's burdens, forgiving when sinned against or grieved. Wouldn't you look in from the outside and say, wow, I want a part of that. I want to be part of that. I want to live in that kind of a community. An attractive view, isn't it? And this is what Paul prays for. This is what Paul longs for when he prays that you would be filled to the measure of the fullness of God. The next question is, how do we become this kind of church? That's what we want to become. That's what Paul wants us to become. That's what he's praying for us. That's what God wants us to become. God wants to dwell amongst us by his spirit. But how do we get there? What's the journey? Well, if you look back at Paul's prayer here, you can still see it on the screen. Paul actually prays a chain. Did you notice that? There's a number of so that, so that, so that that he prays. Would this be the case so that that can be the case so that that can be the case? And the final des- destination and desire is verse 19, so that you'll be filled with the measure of the fullness of God. That's where we're going. But some other things happen to get us there. Notably, verses 18 to 19. Praise that we would have power together with all the Lord's holy people to grasp how wide and long and high and deep is the love of Christ. And to know this love that surpasses knowledge so that we'll be filled with the measure of the fullness of God. You see, the more we grow in our understanding of the depth and the height and the breadth and the width of the love of Christ, Paul's convinced the more we be filled with the presence of God, the more we grow in understanding how much Christ loves us, what he gave for us, that's our journey. To dwell on the love of Christ. To see what it is he's done for us. To be confronted with the gospel 
and stand on it and look as far as we can in that direction and that direction and up and down and wherever and wherever we stand we see the love of Christ going on forever and ever. Paul wants us to grow in that understanding of the love of Christ. Paul's convinced that well, we, the love of Christ is, as it were, the Pacific Ocean and at the moment we've dipped our toe into the ocean and we go, wow, that's good. <laughs> that's some amazing love. I've never seen any love like that before. Paul says, you've just dipped your toe in it and it stretches as far as the eye can see down and up and side to side. Grow in your understanding of the love of Christ. And as you do that, the more we will be filled with the transforming presence of God. This was a very appropriate prayer for Paul to pray at this point in the letter. He'd he'd shown them the love of Christ in the Gospel. Chapters 1, 2, 3... He's about to say, walk in this way. This is how you live now. And so he pauses at this moment and he prays this prayer that they would grasp what he said so that they'd be equipped to live what he's about to say. So it's appropriate for me now as we end here to do exactly that. I'm going to pray this prayer for us at this point that this would be true for us so that in the coming weeks, as we look over chapters 4, 5 and 6, we move forward in that love. So let me pray. For this reason, I kneel before the Father, from whom every family in heaven and earth derives its name, And I pray that out of his glorious riches he may strengthen us with power through his spirit in our inner being so that Christ may dwell in our hearts through faith. And I pray that we, being rooted and established in love, may have power together with all the Lord's holy people to grasp how wide and long and high and deep is the love of Christ and to know this love that surpasses knowledge that we may be filled to the measure of the fullness of God. Now to him who is able to do immeasurably more than all we could ask or imagine according to his power that is at work within us. To him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations, forever and ever. Amen.